fairly robust program by the Libyans. His uh, prime supplier had been a man named Aiken Khan. Khan had been the father of the Pakistani nuclear weapon. Pak's now got somewhere between 50 and 100 nuclear weapons, and the man who was primarily responsible for that was Aiken Khan. After he'd uh, supplied the Pakistanis and got them up and running, he set up his own black market operation, uh, offering that technology and that capability to others for money. His prime uh, customer was Libya, but he'd also dealt with the uh, with the North Koreans and with the Iraqis as well too. So we took down Saddam, we took down Muammar Gaddafi, we took down A.Q. Khan, uh, all as part of that operation when we went into to Iraq uh, in 03. The other thing that's happened since, though, and that, that um, uh, is a, should be a reminder to everybody, and this is based on public sources, uh, and both the New York Times and the Post carry the story over the last year or so, quoting A.Q. Khan who's been under house arrest in Pakistan since we shut down his program, um, quoted him saying that the North Koreans had bribed the Pakistani senior officials in the Pakistani government to acquire uranium enrichment technology. What they'd had before was old British technology from the 1950s, and uh, that's what they produced, the two weapons that they've tested and uh, used, and that's the technology they gave to Syria, remember, in the midst of all of this, too, uh, in 07, uh, we discovered the fact that the Syrians had a completed reactor built for them by the North Koreans in the eastern Syrian desert. Uh, in the end, that problem was solved when the Israelis took it out in fall of 07. But this whole pattern of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, uh, people being able to bribe people who had it, uh, uh, acquired for their own purposes, of uh, people trying to operate a black market, uh, terrorists like Al Qaeda trying to get their hands on deadlier capability. As I look back on it, I think we did exactly the right thing. One of the things I worry about now going forward, hit a hot button, so I apologize for going on so long. But the um, uh, as we go forward now, we're in a position where we're seeing, as a result of the Arab Spring and a lot of history there. I don't know whether the Arab Spring is going to turn out to be a spring or not. Find a lot of arguments that the outcome is not necessarily going to be one we're going to you know, appreciate or uh, uh, believe is necessarily consistent with our interests. But we've seen uh, the Muslim brothers come to power in Cairo. Um, I don't know what's going to emerge in, in Syria. I'm pretty confident that Assad's going down, but I don't know what will come out of that, uh, what kind of regime that's likely to be. Um, and uh, there are likely to be other parts of, of North Africa and the Middle East that are going to head down that same road over the next few years. And in the middle of all that, we've got the Iranians actively and aggressively trying to develop nuclear weapons. And um, one of the things I'm concerned about with where we are in terms of our current policy, I worry very much at a time when it's more important than ever that the United States have the capacity to influence events in that part of the world. And we're pulling out that what it looks like from the standpoint of our allies in that part of the world, looks like the United States is turning its back on the Middle East. Uh, we have not been supportive of Syria, I don't believe. Um, we had, um, um, with all due respect, President Obama um, refused to meet with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, in New York, the General Assembly, but he could go to New York to appear on the view at the same time. Um, I think that's a huge mistake. Uh, I think the Israelis legitimately, increasingly are concerned that they can no longer count on the United States the way they have in the past. But they're not the only ones. You, know, you can go to Riyadh today and close your eyes, and the arguments you'll hear are exactly the same you'll hear in Jerusalem. Um, and that is concerned about the Iranian nuclear program. All the Gulf states have the same degree of concern. But what they see is President Obama, for example, went to Cairo, his first uh, summer in office, delivered a speech where he apologized for the U.S. quote overreaction to the events of 9/11. Said we'd fallen away from our basic fundamental values, and that we'd gone overboard in our response to 9/11. Um, obviously, I fundamentally disagree with that, but I think it's a terrible thing for the president to do. But you can imagine what kind of signal that sends throughout that part of the world. Then the the Arabs look at our treatment of Israel. Uh, because many of them have you know, similar loyalties to the United States. 
and they look to us for support in terms of their security and uh, mm. we're rapidly approaching the point where our friends no longer can count on us out there and our adversaries no longer fear us. Well, you know, well, we'll get to the president and we'll get to uh, Iran, but um, I want to just stick with Iraq for a minute. Um, and we could spend the whole you know, lunch and speaking about Iraq, I'm sure, but um, I just you know, want you to uh, help me with this. You know, uh, and, and because your career has been so long, you've been involved in so many of the successes that we've had, um, like the, uh, going after Noriega in Panama, the Desert Storm, even overthrowing the Taliban, it was sort of all relatively quick. You know, you, you achieved your military objectives pretty quickly right. um, with those instances. But then with Iraq, so we got into this eight-year, you know, uh, war. Um, Four thousand plus lives lost, over thirty-two thousand soldiers wounded, and I think the American public can feel and you know, see the objectives achieved quickly with those three other examples that I mentioned, but with Iraq, I think a lot of Americans can confuse it as to why we were over there and was it all worth it. So, you know, can you explain, you know, to the crowd, you know, you know, was the Iraq invasion of 2003, eight years later, all these lives lost, all those soldiers wounded, worth it? I, uh, it's my very firm belief that it was, and I'd add Afghanistan to that as well, too. Um, I know people are tired of war, I hear it all the time. Um, I've got friends who have been supporters in the past that say, my gosh, it's, it's gone on so long now, shouldn't we uh, shut it down and come home? And uh, of course, we no longer are in Iraq, but we believed when we went in that it wasn't enough to take down the old government, that you had to leave something in its place. And uh, you couldn't just pick out another general, another dictator, and put him in charge. And you swapped one dictator for another, that wasn't uh, consistent with our values. And uh, in terms of the cost, uh, I always balance it over again with the threat that we believe we face in the afternoon of with an active Al-Qaeda operating around the world. And remember, we weren't the only ones here. Spaniards got hit in Madrid, the British got hit in London, Bali was uh, hit in the, in the Far East. Um, they had training camps that they put 20,000 people through in Afghanistan in the late 90s. Uh, there was every reason to expect that there was going to be more. We intercepted other attacks that never came off. The suspected attack on the West Coast, it was supposedly at the tallest building on the West Coast in Los Angeles. The attack on docks in London and Harvard down there on the Thames. Um, and prospective attacks here in the United States. If they'd ever been able to pull one of those off with a chemical or a biological agent or a crude nuclear device, and remember, to have nuclear capability, you don't need to have what we have. You don't need to have a very sophisticated device miniaturized on top of a warhead that will, uh, a missile that will fly 5,000 miles. All you need is a dirty weapon, gives you a low yield, that spreads very the activity around the, the landscape, put it in a shipping container or a semi, and haul it into the middle of one of our cities and crush it off. Uh, you'll kill a hell of a lot more people than we've lost in, uh, in combat in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. The other thing, the point I like to make, it is very hard, obviously, as to in Afghanistan today, where we're still still got people employed and still working the problem. Um, we sort of look at it, and we, my gosh, the, let's look at um, Desert Storm. You know, it was over in uh, in a matter of weeks from the time we started the air campaign till the ground war ended. We had 148 killed in action. Um, it was really a remarkable military performance. Um, but that's not all that's involved. Once you've done that, then what are you going to put in this place? And uh, if you've got a place like Afghanistan that's never had a democracy, uh, never had an elected government before, that uh, we had turned our backs on Afghanistan once before. We were involved there in the 80s, supporting the move against the Soviets. Uh, after that was over with and the Soviets withdrew, we and the others who were helping us all turned our backs and walked away. And that's when Afghanistan was taken over by the Taliban, and that's when Osama bin Laden was invited in in 96, and that's when he set up his training camps and planned 9-11, which he launched and killed 3,000 Americans. So you, you don't want to walk away from that part of the world. The notion that somehow we don't have an interest in what happens in Iraq or what happens in Afghanistan or Iran is just ludicrous, especially in this day and age 
when the kind of technology is increasingly available, that will let you know a terrorist group kill thousands or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of Americans. It's not a freebie. You can just say, well, that's over there. We don't have to worry about it. Anybody who lives in New York and remembers 9-11 has to be aware of the dangers that are to be found out around the world given modern technology. Final point, um, political history. I like to remind people, think about our history. Think about where we started. In 1776, we declare independence. We fight a, a revolutionary war, and it ends finally, officially, in 1783, when uh, the Brits uh, signed a peace treaty with us. Um, then we had the first uh, constitution that got scrapped. The Articles of Confederation wasn't any good. Then we went to work and, and uh, wrote our, our constitution we live under today. It had a few flaws in it, such as women couldn't vote, slavery was okay. Um, it took us 75 years to get that all sorted out. And at the end of the day, the bloodiest war in our history, the American Civil War, where North and South combined lost 750,000 people killed. That's our history. And now we say, gee, you know, we've been in Iraq seven or eight years, we've been in Afghanistan a long time, shouldn't we get out? Um, okay, but recognize, first of all, you're, you're uh, creating a situation where, especially with Islamic fundamentalism appearing to spread throughout that part of the world, increasingly likely to take over governments and control territory that can be sanctuary or safe harbor for Al-Qaeda or fellow travelers. Um, and uh, that it does take time to set up sovereign governments and help them get equipped to be able to govern their own territory and guarantee that it will never again be taken over or become a base of operations against the United States or our European allies. We may not like it. We may not like having to be there. We may not like what it costs us. But I gotta tell you, a major terrorist attack on the United States with a weapon of mass destruction is gonna be a hell of a lot more expensive than anything we spent to date to uh, deal with the threat that many of us believe is, is frankly growing in the part of the world. Thank you for your candid answer. Uh, you mentioned the president before, and we've got 30 minutes without. Um, so let's uh, start uh, uh, getting things closer to home. I understand you're the president of cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Eighth, eighth cousins removed. He's never admitted it. 